Alan was diagnosed with mesothelioma in 2003, and it was the most baffling diagnosis I've ever heard of. We both wondered why and how. How was he exposed to asbestos? Alan worked his whole life as an executive with a suit and tie every day. And it wasn't until the doctor asked, were you ever exposed to asbestos? Was Alan forced to think about during his lifetime when he might have been? Asbestos is a, was once called a magic mineral. Now we call it killer dust. These fibers are invisible. You don't taste them when you swallow them or smell them, and you can't see them, obviously. So back in the 60s, Alan worked in a shipyard where they were designing nuclear submarines and they sprayed asbestos heavily. But he also did home repairs. He loved to fix things. He could fix anything and everything. So he'd lift up floor tiles and spackle walls and little did he know at that time also that the products that he was using that he bought over the counter just in the hardware store contained asbestos. One of the most common questions I get at the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization is where is asbestos found in my home? It makes me think about how Alan was exposed, that with the floor tiles he removed, with the spackling he put on the walls, with those various home repairs with pipes and plumbing. It's a hard issue to, to really pinpoint because asbestos was used so heavily up until the late uh, 1970s in various building materials. And the scary part, it's still in our environment and homes today. There are 35 million homes with attics that have contaminated vermiculite, deadly asbestos in the attics, and those people don't even have a clue. When Alan first had these, this persistent slight cough, it was strange because it was just a slight cough. <coughs> We'd been married so long, run marathons, climbed Half Dome, and skied big, tall mountains around the world. Alan was in amazing shape, and I didn't understand what that cough meant. So with a little humor, I encouraged him to go see a doctor, and that's where our life began to unravel. The doctor, through an x-ray, noted that Alan had a pleural effusion, and over a string of nine months, we came to realize that Alan had mesothelioma. Through a surgical procedure, they identified the cancer. And when the surgeon came out and said to me, Linda, I think Alan might have a kind of lung cancer, I was very optimistic and I thought, a kind you can treat and cure, right? He said, well, I'm not sure yet, but I think Alan might have mesothelioma. I began to cry. I'd never heard of that word, mesothelioma. I asked the doctor, could you please write it down? I, I can't even say it and I've never heard of it. He did on my tear-soaked tissue. And it was that time when I came home at 10 o'clock in the night and I typed it into the computer like every single spouse or family member does upon a diagnosis where you then read about the life expectancy of six to 12 months how asbestos causes so many different kinds of cancers and respiratory diseases, and how your fate will probably be no different than anyone else, because asbestos kills more than 10,000 people in the United States every single year. Men, women, and children lose their lives to, pre to what would be preventable diseases. So there's no reason to use asbestos at all. There are safer substitutions. It is, isn't even a, a cost basis issue. We found out in Mexico when we presented down there that to have brakes made without asbestos literally costs 15 cents an item more. Not enough when you think about the lives that are lost. And it's not just the patient like Alan who struggles to fight a disease and then dies, but it's our family and our friends. So these diseases don't take down one person. It leaves a shattered family behind, trying to recoup, rebuild, and relive what's been torn down all through preventable diseases.